So I'm calling Blood on the Clock Tower my favourite game I've never played. It might also be my favourite game that I don't even want to play. <laughs> um, I, I do want to play it, like, but just once. Like, I don't actually think it's my kind of game. It's a social reduction game, uh, like Werewolf or Mafia. And if anyone's not familiar with that genre, uh, basically you have about eight people together in, in person. Um, and two of them are secretly evil. The evil people know who each other are. The good people don't know who the evil, evil people are. And then day by day, they kind of the, the good, the, the town in general gets to vote uh, for someone to be executed. And then by night, the evil people get to kill somebody. So that's how Blood on the Clock Tower works as well. Um, the, but there are a few differences. It's kind of known for just fixing the problems with that genre. Um, and some of the problems with that genre are um, most people in Werewolf don't have much to do. If you're like uh, the most common role in Werewolf is a villager and they just don't do anything. They just, they're good, they're on the good side, but they don't have any powers or anything. Uh, werewolves have a great time because every night they're choosing to have to kill, they sort of silently vote. Um, uh, and that's really fun. Um, and there are some good players with, with powers and stuff, but most people don't have any, any powers. In Blood on the Clock Tower, everyone has a power. Um, but I want to, I should, before I just spend ages explaining what the game is, because it's, it's actually really the nuts and bolts of it don't matter so much. I want to get into like what's so juicy about it and what, what's so exciting about it. Um, and why I, as someone who <laughs> has never played it, am so into it. Um, it's a much more of a deduction game rather than a social reduction game. Like, it absolutely is a social reduction game as well, but there is so much, like, real juicy mechanics to it. <laughs> and it's not uh, uh, solvable mechanically, he says in an uncertain tone, <laughs> a lot of the time. Like, in my experience, so I've watched, I've watched tons of it on YouTube. That, that is the, the mechanism by which I enjoy this game I do not play. Um, there are tons of playthroughs uh, on YouTube. The official Blood on the Clock Tower channel actually has uh, a bunch of good ones. Um, uh, and I've also, lately I've been joining a new channel called Noobs on the Goof Tower, which is um, uh, a bunch of, of nice folks playing it. Um, I also, my route into it, like a lot of people, was No Rolls Barred, uh, which uh, their sessions I, I think are the best, uh, but the No Rolls Barred recommendation comes with an asterisk because um, the founder, co-founder, uh, Adam, is uh, no longer part of the channel under investigation for misconduct. I don't know anything more about that, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, uh, their, other than that, that their, their cast is, is great, and uh, some of their games are the wildest I've ever seen. <laughs> and it is a game that encourages wild games, uh, because, the, because everyone has a power, and many of those powers are insane <laughs> and uh, just cause absolute havoc. Um, my favorite is, is not that wild, but it just gets my game design brain buzzing. So uh, my favorite is the Amnesiac. Um, every character in Blood and Clock Tower, this is one of my favorite things about it, is, is a sentence basically. Like you get an icon and then a one sentence description of what your character does. Maybe it's two sentences, but it's like the length of one sentence. Um, it's extremely brief, it has to fit on like a tiny little token. Um, and there are hundreds of these, there are so, so many. Uh, and of course that would make the game unplayable if you had to know what all of them do in order to be able to play the game, which generally anyone who could be in the game, you need to know what the possible roles are, how they work in order to be able to play it at all. Um, so what they do is they have scripts um, and the, the base, the sort of standard game of, of Blood on Clock Tower has, has three different scripts. Each one has, I don't know, 12, 15 different roles that, that could be in play. Uh, and if you're playing with like eight people, then eight of them are in play. Everyone's only ever one, there's only ever one instance of each role. Uh, and the Amnesiac doesn't know what they do. <laughs> um, and that's only possible because the ability they really have is made up by the storyteller like, as the game starts. Um, and so, yeah, Blood and the Clock has a story title, you need someone to run it. And that's that's actually something, you know, that is in Werewolf. Uh, Werewolf has a, has a, they call it a, a moderator, which is such a joyous <laughs> thing to call it. Storyteller is a much better term. Um, there, there is someone who just has to run the game, they don't get to play the game. That That's less of a downside than it sounds because the storyteller is having a great time <laughs> because a ton of mechanics in Blood and the Clock Tower are just left to storyteller discretion. There are so many abilities that say, you know, if you do this, you might die, or deaths tonight are arbitrary, uh, or 
this might happen, or uh, and every time that that word comes up, might it means the storyteller just gets to decide, and the storyteller is going to do that based on how well the different teams are doing, and they're going to try and balance the game so that, that it comes to a, a nice tight finish. Um, and uh, I remember I was talking about the amnesiac, but I don't remember how I got from there to the storyteller. Uh, the amnesiac is, is uh, a a character who doesn't know what their ability is, but they have an ability. The storyteller decides what their ability is at the start of the game. And then each night they get to do their ability without knowing what the hell it is. And what that entails is going to be different every game. But often it, it's the storyteller asks them to choose a player. And so they say, okay, Jeff. And then the storyteller will say, three. <laughs> and you're just like, all right. So you, like, the first time you do that, nothing really to go on. You just have to guess. Uh, but the... The other side of their ability is that each day they get to ask the storyteller, they get to basically guess what their ability is, and the storyteller just gives them like a warm, hot, cold kind of uh, response. Um, and they don't necessarily have to get it right, that, you know, that's not their objective, or there's nothing special happens when they guess it correctly, but obviously they want to know what it is so they can use it effectively. And the kind of, the, the general philosophy for running that character is that you give them an ability that, that would be too powerful if they did know what it is. So that they, their journey throughout the game is slowly, they're on their own little quest to understand what it is they can do. And when they find out, if they find out, then they can solve the game potentially. Um, but uh, for a long time, they're just going to be closing in on what, what it is it that I do. Is it to do with like whether the character I picked is evil? Like if it, three, um, I just made that one up. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a Tom Francis original, three. <laughs> that's what I'm known for. I was the guy who said three. Um, it could be something like um, how many players that this player has spoken to are good, as opposed to evil. Um, and just make up something like that and you just give the person the true information. Usually there's some element of player choice, but it could be anything. It could like They could even have a passive ability. They could even have an ability where they don't get told anything, they don't get to choose anything. <laughs> it's like their ability is in play. Obviously that wouldn't give them much to go on. But yeah, I mean, you can tell why me, a game designer, would love this because uh, even though I'm not designing it, just seeing somebody design something on the fly and then have someone else interact with it is, is such a joy. Um, uh, my other... So there are characters who, who have pretty standard roles. Like one's the Slayer, and they, once per game, can just point to someone and say, I'm a Slayer and I slay you! And if that person is the demon, there's only... Oh, I didn't mention that, actually. Blood the Flat Tower only has... They have several evil people in a game, typically, but only one is the demon, and only the demon needs to die for the good team to win. As soon as the demon is dead, good team win. Uh, with a few weird exceptions. <laughs> um, but in general, there's one person they have to kill. So they could get lucky the first day. They could just be like, let's kill that person. And everyone votes on it, and they kill that person, and they're just like, yep, you kill the demon. That doesn't often happen, because um, it's uh, generally played with like eight plus players. Uh, so it's quite low odds of, of doing that. And obviously the demon... Uh, is going to protest that execution pretty pretty uh, strenuously, and that in itself would be suspicious, except that there are a lot of townsfolk, a lot of good characters who have really important abilities who really don't want to die, and for them to be executed on the first day would be a disaster. So somebody saying, like, please don't execute me, I, I don't want to tell you why, but really you shouldn't do it, is, is quite normal. Um, and you should probably listen to it most of the time. Um, so, yeah, there are characters... Uh, the, the, the characteristic signature of it the thing that, because Werewolf has some special roles, and I've played Werewolf with some special roles, um, and some of them are very powerful, um, but they are just a sort of smattering of just the odd thing that, that it doesn't really come together into one big cohesive whole. And Blood on the Clock Tower is this massive clockwork engine of, of uncertainty and doubt and contradiction and partial information, and, and um, watching people piece that together is absolutely fascinating. So to give you some examples, uh, the, there's a character called the Clockmaker. The Clockmaker learns how many places around the circle, you sit in a circle, uh, the demon is from the nearest minion. The minion is just a bad, an evil character who's, who's not the demon. Um, so they might, they'll just get like a two or a three. And that just means whoever the demon and the minion are, they, they are this part apart. If there's multiple minions, it's the closest one. Um, there is another character who... Uh, a lot of characters just start learning something. So a chef learns how many pairs of evil people are sitting next to each other. Um, there is... Uh, a lot of characters will learn, like, this person is one of two roles. They, they could be this person or this person. Or they might learn, 
there is a um, uh, let me think is it like outsiders there'll be, there'll be a particular kind of category of, of character and they'll learn like this one is in play and it's one of the, it's either this person or this person so everything is uncertain there's a fortune teller who can pick every night two players and they are told whether the demon is among those two players they're not told which is which um, uh, but <laughs> so that's uncertainty already you, you still don't even if you get a yes you, you don't know which, who is who um, but then also they have a red herring every game a, some, an innocent player is picked to be their red herring who will show is the demon to them so if if um, Kate is my red herring and I pick Kate and Jeff I get a yes neither of them are the demon there's, there's nothing special about Kate they're just my red herring um, and so uh, there's uncertainty on uncertainty and then also there's characters like the poisoner who is just an evil character who every night picks somebody if they poison them their information is just arbitrary it just could be anything uh, it could be true or it could be false it could be anything um, then there are uh, a lot of the demons poison people in different ways um, there's also a drunk which I, I think is in Werewolf as well I remember something like this in, certainly in, in One Night Ultimate Werewolf um, where the drunk doesn't know they're the drunk they think they're another character and they think they have that ability and in Blood on the Clock Tower uh, anyway they are treated exactly as if they have that ability you know, if, if that ability to wake at night they are woken at night and, and asked to pick somebody to, to do something to and they, they think they're doing it but they don't know uh, there's a lunatic who thinks they are the demon <laughs> who thinks they are the, the, the bad guy the key player in the whole thing they think they're leading the evil team but they're not they're just a random <laughs> folk. and the demon knows who they are they also know who they choose to kill at night so the demon can if they want mimic them like the, the lunatic is picking the lunatic picks Kate to kill at night um, Kate doesn't die because the lunatic isn't the demon but the demon is told hey the lunatic picked Kate do you want to, <laughs> do you want to kill Kate do you want to kill someone else so they can uh, make the lunatic continue to believe that there are so many ways for information to be wrong polluted there's a demon called the Vortox which just means everybody in the game gets false information for the entire game <laughs> just always which actually that, that sounds like the worst case scenario for information it's actually better than being drunk because drunk the storyteller could give you false information or they could give you true information so there's no actual definitive way to ever tell the storyteller could perfectly mimic you being not drunk when you are drunk and then one day you just give you the one false information the vortox they have to give you false information um which you know in the case of the fortune teller who picks two characters and learns if one of them is demon if you know there's a vortex on play and you're the fortune teller and you pick two characters and you learn a no you've just learned a yes <laughs> so it's better than than, than drunk information but the, the, like my first impression watching it was like the good team have no chance here because everything is uncertain there is no hard information you can almost never cling to anything you're told ever and say yeah that's definitely true uh, the best you can do is like when all of town comes together and they piece together information like what it often comes down to is like well okay you could have been drunk you could have been drunk you could have been drunk you could have been poisoned you could have been mad you could have been this but but not all of those things at once <laughs> so if like you were poisoned and you were drunk and you were mad then this person would have to be right <laughs> but it could be the other way around <laughs> it's just it seems like an absolute nightmare um but then when you hear storytellers talk about it uh the way they they say it is that the evil team starts losing like they, they are losing when the game starts and the storyteller with all their arbitrary decisions and the things they they are allowed to just decide for themselves they will basically act as if they are on the evil team they will make everything go evil's way for as long as possible if evil are lying about something they will tweak information to support the lie um if you know good are, are narrowing in on them uh, you know if there's any drunkenness or poisonness they'll do it, they'll use it to like frame an innocent player they will do all these evil kind of uh, contrived things to like intentionally tip the scales against good uh just because i mean really kind of coming back to what i said which is like you could execute the demon on day one um, I heard it phrased uh, a different way recently, which is like, um, uh, you know, this is this is adapted from somewhere else. But uh, the evil team have to get lucky every day, and the good team only have to get lucky once, <laughs> which is true. Um, and so the storyteller is trying to make sure that the evil team doesn't die too early. And then the further into the game you get, the more they take their hands off the wheel and say, "All right, well now what happens happens." Um, and really, the game kind of wouldn't work without the storyteller doing that like there's so much in it that would be wildly unbalanced if you didn't have a thinking <laughs> uh, person actively running the game and thinking about what is the most fun thing to happen that's usually their, their watchword is like you know what's the fun thing to happen here 
Um, yeah. My other favorite character is the Snake Charmer. The Snake Charmer, each knight picks a player. If that person is not the demon, nothing happens. If that person is the demon, the Snake Charmer becomes the demon, and the demon becomes a drunk Snake Charmer. In other words, a useless character. But they switch alignments too. So, like, if you're a good Snake Charmer, you're on the good team, you want the good team to win, and you're, every night you're trying somebody, each night that it doesn't, nothing happens, brilliant. I've eliminated that person as a demon. Huge information. But if you ever pick the demon, now you're the demon, you're evil, you have to win as evil, but you don't know who your minions are, you don't know any of the information, and the person you just swapped with just became a good snake charmer, and so they know exactly who the minions are, they were the demon, now they're on the good team, they have every reason in the world to come out to town and say, hey, I was the demon, <laughs> whoever was the snake charmer is now the demon. They don't actually know who the snake charmer is, of course, unless, unless you, as the snake charmer, were stupid enough to tell everyone who you're the snake charmer. Um, and so they can just reveal all the information and just kind of tank the evil team strategy. Um, and so the Saint John is just a fascinating character where, you know, there's, it would be fascinating even if it was coded in stone that you don't want to switch teams, that, that you know, you're just trying to get as much information as you can, because then how many people do you check? Because you can just check yourself. You can just, you know, opt out. So, like, it, it sounds like sort of three is a reasonable number in a reasonable size game to be like, check this person. If you don't turn into a demon, great. Check this person, don't turn into a demon, great. Check this person, don't turn into a demon, great. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to turn into a demon because it's not just about not wanting to be evil because, the, you know, there's no particular reason not to want to be evil. If evil are going to win, then great. But evil aren't going to win <laughs> if their demon is someone who just showed up and doesn't know what the fuck's going on. Um, and it just leads to incredible stories. Um, there's another character also pretty high on my list for, for favorite mechanics called the Serenobus, who each night, they're an evil character, each night they pick a person uh, to be delusional that they are a particular character. So the Serenobus doesn't necessarily know who they really are. They just say, like, uh, Jeff is going to... Uh, the way... This is one of my few complaints. Tom the Cocktail calls this being mad about something. Like, there's a character called the Mutant who is... If you are mad about being an outsider, you might be executed. The Mutant is an outsider. Mad about being like that? It's just the phrasing just doesn't make any sense. Delusional is what they mean. Um, and what it means is you must claim that thing. Um, uh, and so the Serenovus can make people delusional that they are a certain character, which means they must claim to be that character, or they will be executed, which is worse than just dying because it, it also ends the day. It kind of uses up the execution for the good team of that day. Um, and there is an incredible No Rolls Wild game where uh, uh, Sully is the demon and is doing an absolutely terrible job of it. He's, the only reason he survives as many days as he does is he's picked such a terrible bluff that no one can believe any demon would ever pick that bluff. <laughs> Which is like, well, he can't be the demon because no demon would pick such a stupid bluff because as a useless this character is just used up, doesn't need to, to live anymore. And so the one thing you need as a demon is like a good reason to stay alive um, if, with your bluff, with your lie. Um, but everyone's so flabbergasted that anyone could ever pick that as a demon that they don't suspect it's a demon. And then another player, Carly, who is incredible at this game, just, just, it's, even with all I know about it, even how, with how many games I've watched, seeing her with way less information than I have, because I'm watching the, from the storyteller perspective, so I see who everybody is, I know all the hidden information, um, and she just magically knows this stuff, just has this incredible intuition for it. Um, she's on the evil team. She's the Serenova. She can make anyone say they are whoever they, they, um, uh, she wants them to say. And her demon is Sully, who is, uh, I can't even remember what type of demon he is, but uh, he's doing a terrible job because he's bluffed as the clockmaker, which is that one that I mentioned, that just gets a number at the start of the game and never gets a number ever again. So there's no reason to keep him around, really. It's fine for them to die which is a terrible thing to say as a demon. Um, and she has deduced that there is a snake charmer somewhere in the game. And in fact, I think she's even deduced who it is. Um, and uh, just on pure instinct, on like the last night of the game, I think it is, uh, she thinks, I, you know, I think there's a snake charmer in the game. I think they're going out of circle. They also haven't found the demon yet. I think they might find them tonight. And if they do... I want to make sure the demon can't come out and say they're the demon and, and spill all the, the juicy information. So she chooses her own demon to be delusional 
that they are the clockmaker, which is what they're already saying they are, <laughs> which is just such a galaxy brain play. I'm gonna, I'm gonna force someone who's on my own team to say what they're already saying, which sounds like a totally useless thing to do. But sure enough, Isaac the Snake Charmer picks Sully that night, becomes the demon, Sully becomes a good Snake Charmer, and would love to come out to town and tell everybody that they were the demon, here's the minions, and let's, let's kill them and, and, and win. Uh, he doesn't necessarily know who the Snake Charmer is, but um, uh, it's pretty solvable from there. But he can't because his own minion that night, just on a kind of whim, <laughs> just on instinct, picked him and forced him to say that he is the clockmaker, which is what he was already saying. So he has to <laughs> just keep saying he's the clockmaker. And I was like, yeah, we know, shut up. <laughs> Uh, just incredible. Um, and there are so many games like that, like uh, almost all the ones that they posted have some wild thing in them. I just watched one where um, uh, somebody who, the evil demon, uh, one of the first people they talk to says that they are the empath. The empath can sense if the people next to them are evil or not. And this person says that they're the empath and they've got a, a clean read on this guy, like they're not evil. And that is enough to convince the demon that they're not the demon, that they're the lunatic, and uh, they just out that right away. So this is the act, they are the actual demon, and they just come out right out and say, I was told I was the demon. <laughs> this is the, like, on day one, absolute disaster. This is the worst thing you possibly do. This is going to end the game immediately. The game is three hours long. <laughs> because it's such, again, like... It's such an insane thing for the demon to do. And he's so, he genuinely believes he is the lunatic, doesn't believe he's the demon. And that earnestness kind of carries him through for a huge amount of time. Where, like he's just told people he's the demon, uh, but no one quite believes it because he doesn't believe it. Um, yeah, just, just a wild game. And yeah, everyone having a role um, has a big impact on that. Um, the roles just being so wild and, and wacky. There's. I don't even want to talk about the evil twin. I just listened to a podcast about the evil twin. There's a, uh, a podcast called Cult of the Clock Tower where every episode is just about one character. They used to talk about the strategy of that character. Evil twin is, just breaks my mind. And I really, like, this is the kind of thing my mind likes. <laughs> I like logical reasoning. I like deduction. I like critical thinking. And I like game mechanics. And I like wacky, very heavily themed, cool um, uh, character types. Um, just just the different kinds of demon in this game are, are wild. They're, they're so colourfully named. That the one that inverts all the information, I can't remember if I mentioned this, uh, I mentioned the character, but I can't remember if I mentioned the name, it's called a Vortex, which is like a vortex of intoxicating information. Um, there's uh, the Nodashi, which is a kind of tentacle monster that reaches out and poisons townsfolk, um, and it's named after the uh, Nodachi. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, sword, which is like a long sword, so it's like a long reach. Um, and yeah, there are, all of the names are just very characterful and evocative. Um, and the thing, so all of that is just like werewolf but better, right? Um, and oh, I, I, maybe I should mention the reason I don't want to play it, <laughs> or the reason I haven't played it, is I don't really like social reduction games um, because they're stressful. Uh, I don't like having to lie. I, I don't like having to lie and I also don't like having to say I'm not lying when I'm not lying <laughs> like you would think that part would be easy but it's not and I hate it like I hate it's because I'm very I'm not a persuader I'm not someone who'll try and like you know talk you around or um sway you without logical concrete information I you know, for me this is like a a respect thing like you don't try and persuade somebody of something unless you can show them some reason they should believe it. You don't just try and bluster it. Um, that's just like ha not how I deal with people. And sure, it's a game. You're allowed to be someone you're not normally. Uh, I'm, I like role playing, uh, but I can't do that. I can't, I can't just like, even if I'm completely innocent, if someone like comes at me hard and, and is saying I'm guilty, if I don't have a concrete piece of evidence I can point to to say I'm innocent, I'm just like, all right, well, <laughs> there's nothing I can say, really. <laughs> and that's not how you play this game. <laughs> that's like, people who are successful at this game do not do that. Um, but I just can't, you know, I feel like uh, it, it would feel so fraudulent for me to ever say, like, no, but I am the good twin. No, but I am good. I swear I'm good. Like, it, it just feels so empty to me. 
And, but I love watching it. I, I love the, uh, I think the game design of it is fascinating. Um, yeah. And then, so all of that is just werewolf, but better. And then th there's something extra to this where it feels like a live service game, which is a video game term. Uh, this is a tabletop game. Um, but uh, I, I don't know how big this game is because like almost none of my friends have heard of it but there's a Blood on the Clock Tower convention <laughs> and um, uh, there's all these videos out there that, that, that have a ton of views and it just feels like a culture and a community. It feels like a thing unto itself, like a world you can be part of. That's part of what I've been enjoying about it is not just watching all these individual videos of it, but like the official channel every few weeks, it seems like that there's a new character that they've, that's not in the game yet, but that they call them experimental characters. We're like, we just came up with this idea. Here it is. We're going to play a game with it now. And you just watch them play like a, you know, it'll be like a two hour game um, that shows off that new character. And sometimes that, you know, it shows off brilliantly and, and uh, that new character, you get to see why it's useful or why it's crazy. Um, sometimes it, uh, like sometimes they won't even put the new character in the game because that's the scripts thing. Like the when you play a game, there's a script for all the things that could be in the game, and only maybe half of them are in, uh, maybe a bit more. Um, but the presence of things on the script has an effect on the game. Like the vortex, the, the vortex is a demon where if it's in play, all information is false, and if you don't execute someone every day, you lose the game. Uh, so if the vortex is in play, obviously that has an effect. If Vortex is not in play, that still has an effect because people really don't want to go a day without executing because it could be a Vortex. Until we know it's not a Vortex, we have to assume it is a Vortex. So sometimes the new character isn't even in the game, but just its presence on the script has such a <laughs> distorting effect on how people behave and what they do that it still show showcases the character. Uh, but yeah, it's just, that's what makes it a very exciting like thing to be a part of. To, to um, It reminds me of how Valve talk about the most successful games uh, and kind of what they latched onto in... in live service game stuff where like it's just fun to be a fan of this thing separately from actually playing it like you know that i mean i think dota is is probably what they would would point to as as you know something that, that existed outside of valve um but which they all they thought was already being run in a sort of exemplary way where just being a fan of dota um was a fun experience because new characters are being released and the game is constantly being updated and you're just like being part of that you're always getting something and weirdly i feel like i get that from blood and cocktail without ever playing it like um the other week they showed off the village idiot a new character which um every night they get to choose somebody and, to, and find out whether they're good or evil hugely powerful power um but it is tainted by the fact that if there is more than one village you didn't play, this is one of the rare roles where there can be more than one of them, um, one of them is drunk. Uh, if there's only one, they're not drunk. If there's three, one of them is drunk. Um, and uh, that's not like the biggest disadvantage in the world, but what it kind of means is that it's, it's a real easy bluff for the evil team, because usually the one reason, the thing that stops you from bluffing as a, as a particularly good character is that you don't know if that person might be in play. If there is another one, it's called a double claim, is it because there's only ever one of a character. Uh, claiming it yourself, um, if, someone, if someone else is claiming it, immediately puts you in a kind of 50-50 situation where now you're, under, you're both under suspicion, but because uh, there's so few evil players, it's a, it's a worse thing for the evil player. Uh, and also they're not getting real information, so it's harder to bluff that the, the good player will have an easier time uh, proving that they are that character. But for this one, there could be up to three of them, I think, is the, is the maximum. And one of them is going to be wrong all the time, so the information doesn't have to be right either. And so you just get, like, seven people claiming to be the village idiot. Um, and, yeah, that, that, that's just really fun. And I don't have to play that to enjoy it. <laughs> it was just a cool thing to watch. Um, it really, really gets me thinking about, I don't know, I, I would love to make a game where making new content for it was, you know, I was about to say, was that easy? I don't want to say it's easy because I have no idea what goes into this. And I'm sure I, I get the impression from listening to some of the behind the scenes stuff that like it is a nightmare to design some of these characters. But the, ca the content itself, rather than being, you know, a DLC for a video game that required artists and, and modelers and animators and, and um, uh, 
all kinds of engineering work and bug fixes and, and things like that it is just a sentence and an icon. <laughs> like that's that's the what you actually have to distribute. The, the distributable, distributable. That is a word, and I'm not quite sure how I say it. Um, is is so lightweight, is so tiny, and you just throw that out in the world, and the game design implications explode, and the psychological implications, the bluffing implications, and uh, all of that stuff is just sort of endlessly rich and deep. Uh, it's super cool to see.